Welcome back to Bio 180. And in our last discussion, we had talked about osmosis and diffusion. And so now we're going to be talking about our second topic in Module 5 on cell processes. And that's going to be protein mediated transport. And so what happens is previously we had talked about having a membrane. And so we had different solutes in the membrane and we talked about concentration gradients. And we'd also said that there are certain things in the membrane that are able to simply diffuse. So they'll pass through if you're small and if you're nonpolar, you can pass through the membrane and move down your concentration gradient. But a lot of other things, anything that's charged, you're often polar. Uh, molecules have a difficult time if they can get through the membrane at all. Charged molecules like ions and then large molecules like proteins and DNA uh, have a hard time getting through. And so for those to get through, so let's say we have a, a charge on this solute right here. And so that's going to mean that it can't go through that membrane at all by itself or unaided. And that's where today's topic comes into play. We can have... different types of proteins that can serve as a conduit or a way for these ions to get across the membrane. And hence, we have the name protein-mediated transport. The transport is being mediated by proteins as some kind of conduit. And so there's a lot of vocabulary associated uh, with today's lesson. And so we're going to start out over here making uh, something that uh, we refer to as a concept map. And a concept map is going to take a lot of the terms associated with protein-mediated transport and kind of map them out so we see what the connections are between them. So this one, I'm going to start up here. and We're going to put our topic protein-mediated transport. And so that's our first concept. We'll put a box around that. And protein-mediated transport can really be divided into two categories based upon energy. And so we'll put, we're going to put a line down here. And we're going to connect it to two other concepts. And so the first concept over here that we're going to explore is protein-mediated transport can either be active, so we'll call this active transport. And then over here on the other side is going to be passive transport. And this is going to be based upon energy, so whether it uses energy or not. Over here on active transport, let's put a couple other lines. So active transport, when we create a concept map, we're going to have our concepts here in boxes. And then the links between them, the arrows or the lines going between those concepts, we're going to add additional words um, or linking words. And so active transport, we're going to say requires energy. And we're also going to define active transport as things moving. We talked about concentration gradients before, and so we're going to use the abbreviation for concentration gradient up here. So concentration gradient. And they move, if we're doing active transport, then the solute is going to move up or we would say against its concentration gradient. So active transport is, require, is defined by something requiring energy and by it moving up. The solute is going to move up its concentration gradient. And that's what defines active transport. We could go over here and fill out passive transport is going to be kind of the, 
opposite. So we'll put in energy in this box over here. And this one, instead of requiring energy, active trans or passive transport actually is a release of energy. So this one would have a negative delta G. And we are going to be moving down or with our concentration gradient. Now, if we come back over here to active transport, active transport can likewise be divided into two categories. So we'll move down and we're going to put another couple bars over here. And active transport can be divided into two categories based upon the energy source. Where is the energy coming from? And so on one category, we're going to be calling this primary transport or primary active transport. And then on this, we're going to call this one secondary transport. Now, these are divided based upon their energy source. So what is their energy source? We'll put down here source. In primary transport, our source of energy is going to come from ATP hydrolysis. In secondary transport, our source of energy is going to be something we talked about last time, and that is the electrochemical gradient. And so that's our source of energy. Now, and this is why we end up getting, uh, calling these primary transport and secondary transport. Primary transport, let's, since it's primary, let's deal with that first. The source of energy is ATP. We also, primary transport, we'll put this down here, are called, so when you have a primary transporter, we say that those are called pumps. Uh, the ATP is going to act as an energy source. We'll show you the exact mechanism of how this works in a couple of minutes. But ATP is the, is the primary or original source of energy. In some cases, this ATP moves a primary transporter or a pump to pump an ion or some kind of driver molecule across the membrane. And so the pump is used to create an electrochemical gradient. And then the electrochemical gradient serves as a source of energy for secondary transport. So in order to carry out secondary transport with an electrochemical gradient, you have to have a pump working to establish that electrochemical gradient in the first place. And we'll show you how that works later. But that's why it's called primary and secondary transport. That being said, the source of energy for secondary transport, the most proximal source, is the electrochemical gradient. Secondary transport, we had a name for primary transporters. Secondary transporters also have a name. And they are called co-transporters. So we have co-transporters, that's what they're called. And then we can also start to write up here, maybe we'll come off of here a pump and some examples of pumps. So some examples, we'll talk about one today called the sodium-potassium pump. Uh, and so that's a pump. We'll talk about another one called the calcium or circa. So it's called the circa pump. We'll talk about this later when we talk about uh, cell signaling. So we've got sodium, potassium, and actually another pump that you guys are already familiar with 
is ATP synthase. So ATP synthase actually is a type of pump. Uh, it's a, what we call a proton pump. We talked about it making ATP, but it can actually run in reverse from the way we learned it. It can use ATP instead of moving protons through down the concentration gradient, it can actually pump protons up a concentration gradient. And so it's a pump. Some uh, co-transporters, we're not going to give you some specific examples of co-transporters, but we are going to give you a little bit of vocabulary associated with co-transporters. And co-transporters, in order to operate, are going to need, so co-transporters need, they need two different molecules or solutes. So we'll put solute needs here. And every co-transporter needs what we're going to call a driver solute and a passenger solute. And so the driver solute is going to move down its concentration gradient. And the passenger solute is going to move up its concentration gradient. And again, we'll show you an actual mechanism of how this works in a moment. But every co-transporter has to have these two solutes. One is going to be the driver moving down its concentration gradient. And that's what provides the energy. That's the electrochemical gradient. And then the other solute, we're going to be actively transporting against the concentration gradient. That's going to be the passenger. Co-transporters also, a couple other terms that we'll give you, come in two flavors based upon direction. And so we have... a term that we call a symporter. And a symporter is where the passenger, we'll write a P here, so the passenger and the driver are both moving in the same direction. So they might be both coming from outside to inside the cell, or they might be going both inside the cell to outside of the cell. But in either case, they're both, the passenger and the driver are both moving in the same direction with respect to the membrane. They're both either coming inside the cell or they're both going outside of the cell. The opposite of, an an, of a symporter then is called an antiporter. And so antiporters, if it's the opposite, you may have already guessed that the passenger and the driver then are moving in opposite directions. And it doesn't really matter which way is which. The passenger could be moving out or into the cell. It only matters that the driver is moving in the opposite direction. And we'll see that when uh, we talk about mechanisms again. So as you look at this, it starts to get a little bit jumbled. Concept maps are a, a good way of visualizing things, but really the creation of the concept map is what really matters as you put this together. We also start to see a lot of relationships come up. So if I said, for example, on a test question, uh, what, uh, what kind of transport mechanism uses an electrochemical gradient? And maybe the answer, it could be secondary transport, but I could also have co-transporters in there because they're linked to this. They're using electrochemical gradients and they are a type of secondary transport. And so it gives you a good idea of the connections of how things are related. If you're a primary transport, you are automatically an active transporter, right? Because you're all falling under that heading. Let's talk about one more. Let's add one more category up here. And that's going to be... We'll call this the mechanism. So all track active transporters, whether they're primary transporters, 
or secondary transporters use a common mechanism that we're going to call confirmation shift. And all a confirmation shift means is that you're going to have the protein, the transporter, will be in one confirmation. It will be in one shape. That's what confirmation means. And then something will happen, some kind of energy, either from the electrochemical gradient or from ATP, is going to cause that protein to change its shape or its conformation. And that's what's going to produce the solute moving up or against its concentration gradient. And we'll look at a couple of mechanisms uh, that use that conformation shift later in the lesson. But for right now, we do need to identify that all active transporters use that conformation shifting as their mechanism of action. Now, let's come back over here to passive transport. Under passive transport, we could fill out passive transport actually has two different mechanisms of action. They also have some that are conformational shifting. In fact, let's put So we'll put mechanism. And on one side, you do have confirmation shift as a mechanism. So some passive transporters do use a, a confirmation shift as their mechanism. And those are called uniporters. So if you see something labeled as a uniporter, then you'll know that it's associated with passive transport and uses a confirmation shift. The other one is actually far simpler. The other mechanism that we tend to see are simply channel proteins. And channel proteins are really just defined as a whole. So they're just a hole in the membrane. They're a pore. There's something that just makes a hole in the membrane that other particles like ions can go through. So channel proteins uh, are often gated. So they're a little bit more than just a hole in the membrane in that they also will have a lot of times some kind of gating mechanism. And you can think of that as like a lid. If I have a channel protein like my fist that would just be a hole in the membrane, they would often have either some kind of lid or they would have a constriction mechanism, but something that could open and close that channel so that it was open or closed and allow the solutes to pass through. But the channel proteins can only undergo passive transport. If you just have a hole in the membrane, you can't push something through that hole. There's no mechanism for that. So all it does is it just allows the concentration gradient to drive down it. So there are a couple of different mechanisms for gating or, or things that cause these channels to open and close. So for gating mechanisms, you can have some channels that are what we call ligand gated. And we'll show you what that means uh, in, a, in a minute. You can also have voltage-gated channels. And you can have what we call mechanically-gated channels. And those are just different ways of opening and closing. So we can use a ligand. We can use some kind of small molecule that when it binds to the protein, it opens or closes it. Voltage would use charge to open and close that channel. And mechanical gated has some kind of, as it suggests, mechanical. So pushing or pulling physically on that protein will open or close that channel.
And so those are our channel proteins. Uh, we'll put one more note on channel proteins. Most channel proteins are fairly limited in their solutes. So solutes for channel proteins are primarily ions. So those are things like potassium. I mean, you'll hear about potassium channels, sodium channels, chloride channels. About the biggest molecule that we know of that goes through an actual channel is water. So we do have some water channels called aquaporins. That comes from aqua, meaning water, and porin, meaning pore or whole. So uh, usually it's pretty small stuff that goes through channels. Uh, so, and that's going to complete our map of a lot of the terms associated with protein-mediated transport. Now, in the next section of this lesson, what I want to do is start to go in and look at actual mechanisms. Let's look at a channel protein and how it operates. And then let's start to look at some of these active transporters, uh, ATP, and how a pump might work, and go over an example of that, and a co-transporter and how that might work. So, let's come over here and let's start talking about mechanisms of action. So in our first, let's consider a ligand gated ion channel. So this will be a, a channel mechanism. So of course we have to have some kind of membrane. And in that membrane, we are going to have our protein. OK. And so this is, well, I, I'm not a very good uh, illustrator, so I'm going to label. This is going to be for my channel, the lid. So this is the actual channel. They're outlined in blue. And then the solid blue color, that's going to be my Let's not call it a lid, let's call it a gate. So that's going to be my gating mechanism. And in this case, it's ligand gated. Ligand simply means a small molecule or something that binds to a protein. So it's not a very specific term. And right here, that little pocket is going to be my ligand binding site. All right, now the next thing we need in our model or our diagram is we're going to need, I'm going to put a ligand. So we got a red ligand. And then we're going to use, we need something to go through our channel. And we're going to make it, this is going to be a sodium ion. And so we have a concentration gradient here. And so even though the, the ligand, we said that its mechanism is just a pore, we do have some action that happens in this. And we'll draw that. OK. So here's essentially what happens. In order for this mechanism to work, the first thing that happens is a ligand. Something has to come in. Right now, our channel in its original state is closed. And so we're going to have this ligand come in here. And that's going to be step one. And that's going to be ligand binding. Now, when the ligand comes in here, it nestles in. It's using weak bonds to bind to that protein. You guys have learned about weak bonds before. And that's going to cause, when that ligand comes in, this little uh, projection on the gate is going to close down around it in order for it to make weak bonds as well. And so when it closes down, that gate moves from being on top to an open position, and we just opened our channel. 
Now, so that is, you might be saying, well, that sounds like a confirmation shift. And that's what step two is. It is a confirmation shift of the gate, but not necessarily of the channel. Okay? So the next thing that happens is with the gate open, we get the solute moving into or through the channel into the inside just according to its concentration gradient. So it's just going to move down its concentration gradient. Now eventually this ligand in step four is going to leave there, uh, leave that binding pocket and when it does then the lid will close and we'll go back to the beginning confirmation and then we won't have any more solute going through. So that's how a ligand gated ion channel works. It's using the presence or absence of a ligand to determine whether that gate is open or closed. Other gating mechanisms work very similar. So if this were a voltage gating mechanism, instead of the ligand controlling it, there'd be some kind of charge. When you had a positive charge inside the cell, then it would open. When the cell went back to a negative charge, then it would close. That would be voltage gating. It would just, the lid would operate based on charge. And then mechanical gating, instead of having a ligand here, we would have some kind of uh, fiber that might connect this end and, and pull down, physically pull down or, or open that channel. So that's how ligand gated ion channels work. For our next mechanism, let's erase this. And let's go over a pump. We're going to talk about the sodium potassium pump. Now, a lot of people are, it's also called, you'll hear it, the sodium potassium ATPase. ATPase is just another name for pump. Uh, because remember, because it's a pump, Where's the energy from the, for this mechanism coming from? It's going to be from ATP, right? That's what we said pump means. A lot of people will confuse this. I'll just go over this common misunderstanding. This particular pump is a little bit confusing because it pumps both sodium and potassium. And so a lot of students, because there's two solutes moving, want to confuse this with a co-transporter that we talked about earlier. But remember, co-transporters use electrochemical gradients. Uh, we have one driver going down the concentration gradient, a, a passenger going up. This doesn't have that. Both sodium and potassium in our model are going to be going up or against their concentration gradients, and ATP is going to be the energy source. So don't make that misconception. This is a pump mechanism, not a co-transporter mechanism. So, like before, we are going to need in our model, as we draw out our diagram, we're going to need a membrane. So here's our membrane. We are going to have a pump. So we have the protein. Okay, so here's my pump. And there's a couple of things that we want to note about this particular pump. And this is, we're going to call this confirmation one. And right up here, let's write a couple notes about this. In confirmation one, notice that the pump itself has this active site or binding site open to the inside of the cell. So we're going to put binding site open to cytosol. So that's one of the conditions that's particular about the way I've drawn that. There's a couple of other points that are important. Right here, what we've drawn, these are actually the sodium binding sites. So every pump has to have a binding site or a location where the solute is going to bind. And so we have a sodium binding site right there. And then these little triangles on this side are our potassium binding site. 
Remember that this particular pump moves both potassium and sodium, so we have to have binding sites for each one. In this particular way we've drawn it, the sodium sites, sodium bind sites, are, we're going to call them tight, meaning that they're open for sodium. They're going to bind sodium tightly in this conformation. And we also have potassium binding sites. And those are what we refer to as loose, simply meaning that, I know it looks like they're small, like it not, might not be very loose in there, but we still refer to it as loose, meaning that potassium is not going to bind to those sites very well. So we have uh, tight sodium binding sites, loose potassium binding sites, and then we also have what we call no phosphorylation site. So we're going to add over here, we're going to put this little stick right there, and that is going to be my phosphorylation site. Right there on that end. A couple other things we need to draw. Let's draw our sodium ion. We're going to draw sodium in purple. So here's our sodium ion. And so we're going to draw a high concentration of sodium outside the cell. And then inside the cell, it's actually a relatively low concentration of sodium. And this is a kicker. We actually want to move against our concentration uh, gradient, and so sodium is going to move from the inside of the cell to the outside. That would be moving up the concentration gradient. We also need to draw our potassium. So we're going to draw potassium as triangles. They also have a positive charge. And then potassium actually has a high concentration inside the cell. So it's just the opposite, concentration-wise, of sodium. And so that's, that sets up the stage. So we have potassium. And it is low outside the cell, high inside the cell. And again, because we're pumping it, actor transport, we want to move potassium here from its low concentration to its high concentration inside the cell. So how does that work? Well, we know that pumps, we said earlier that the mechanism for pumps was through a conformational shift. So we know that the pump has to go through a conformational shift. Here's what that conformation looks like. Here's what the other conformation looks like. So in our second conformation, so we could write number two, conformation two. We've now changed things a little bit, right? Most people will look at the most obvious change that we've made is we have opened up the protein. It's now exposed. So binding is open to the extracellular matrix. So it's now open to the extracellular side. A couple other things have happened, though. In conformation two, now our sodium side, sodium binding, is loose. And potassium binding, they're kind of small triangles over here, and now they've opened up to be larger triangles. So we would say potassium binding is tight, and notice our phosphorylation site over here now has a phosphate on it. So we would be phosphorylated. Now, where did this uh, phosphate come from? 
Well, let's walk through the different steps of the mechanism and see how that works. So we'll try and I'll draw them over here and then I'll try and write the steps as we go through them over here as well. So we're going to start out in condition one. Here's things. The first thing that happens is my sodium has to fill up these sites. So in step one, sodium enters transporter. Now, sodium is at low concentration, so it's bumping around. This may take a while for this to actually happen. But remember, the sodium binding sites are tight. So as soon as the sodium does encounter this site, it sticks there. And it's held there. And then once we get three of those sodiums occupying those sites, then we get our second step. And our second step is going to be ATP is going to come along and form ADP, and that's what causes the phosphate. So ATP donates one of its phosphates to the protein, and that is what drives our conformation shift. So ATP donates a phosphate to the pump, and that drives in step three our conformational shift. So this change, that's step three for us. Phosphorylation is step two, binding is step one. Now, over here in condition two that we have, remember we had the sodium ions that were in there. When that goes into conformation two, those sodium sites close now on them. And what they effectively do is kick the sodium off. The sodium doesn't really want to come off. It's at high concentration over here. And so it doesn't really want to come off. It's really crowded. But there's no more room. It's as if uh, the chair, if you've ever seen those reclining chair or those uh, folding seats in the back, it's as if they were in the car and they were getting transported. And then all of a sudden, someone pushed a button and the seat folded up on them. And so they just literally get ejected out. And new passengers, new po sodium passengers can't come in because the seat's all folded up. And so the binding site has changed. So the sodium then releases. So in step four, sodium is pushed out of transporter. And while the sodium seat's closed, what happened to the potassium seats? Well, the potassium seats actually opened. So potassium actually wants to come in. Now, it's at low concentration, so this may take a while, but it's got a nice, attractive seat here. It's totally folded, so it's open. Maybe we're going to put a, a root beer in the cup holder. I mean, we're going to make everything nice for potassium to come in here and hang out for a while. In fact, when it does come in, we're actually going to strap the seatbelt on and they're not going to be able to get out. And so once we get two potassiums happening, so over here, step five, potassium enters the transporter. Once we get two potassiums sitting there in those seats, now we're going to, the protein comes along and removes the phosphate. So now what we're going to do is we're going to cut that phosphate off and it leaves. So that's going to be step six. It gets removed. Well, once the phosphate leaves, remember what drove the pump into conformation two in the first place? What was the addition of that phosphate? Now, if we remove that phosphate, then in step seven, we just return back to our original conformation. So seven, we again undergo a conformation shift back to our ground state. And then in steps eight and nine, 
Again, we're talking about the seats, the binding sites. The seats close up on potassium, it leaves. So potassium is kicked out. And now we have sodium enters. And so actually step nine is the same as step one. And so now we're back at the beginning. We can go through another cycle. And that's how the sodium potassium pump works. Now, there's a couple of points that we want to make about the sodium potassium pump. So that's the mechanism. This actually ends up being really a pretty important pump. We call it electrogenic, where it actually pumps out, pumps three sodiums out and two potassiums in per cycle or per ATP. Now, this is important for a couple reasons. One is it's electrogenic. What do we mean by electrogenic? Well, we're pumping three positive charges out of the membrane, but only two positive charges in or, or into the cell. And so what that, if you do that enough, over time you create an imbalance of charge. And so this is one of the sources of that membrane potential. You've got high sodium outside. There's, if you talk to the physiologist, they'll also tell you that there's leaky channels and the potassium flowing back out. So there's some other causes, but the electrogenic sodium potassium pump is one of the root causes. If you don't have that gradient, then you don't have a membrane potential. Okay? So it's electrogenic because of the imbalance of charges that we're pumping. It also creates a sodium gradient outside of the cell. And that sodium gradient is then a common driver so it's a common driver of co-transport. And so this is what we mean by primary and secondary. So the pump, again, is a primary transporter. It's using ATP to create this sodium gradient. And then we're actually, in a second, going to look at using this sodium gradient to drive a co-transporter. Okay? And so the, the co-transporter is going to be secondary. It's using the gradient that's produced by the primary transporter, the pump. Okay? Some cells will use as much as two-thirds of their ATP just driving the sodium-potassium pump. Some nerve cells that are really active on uh, uh, transporting and, and um, doing some of those activities will use a lot of ATP driving this pump. It's also, the pump is also used to regulate, we talked about this Earlier, it regulates osmolarity and tonicity. Why does it do that? Well, remember that we said that water, in our last lesson, will follow the higher concentration of solute. Well, if we activate this pump, it tends to pump solute. The net movement of solute is outside of the cell, and so that will pull water with it. So if the cell is, uh, is swelling up too much, we have too much water coming in, has too high of a concentration, we can activate the sodium-potassium pump. It's going to pump a lot of sodium out of the cell. Water is going to flow to it. We're, we're getting rid of a, a net uh, change in our solute concentration to the outside of the cell, and water will flow out and decrease that tonicity. Okay, And so... Uh, it's Im important in the osmotic regulation of the cell. So, very important pump to know. We will expect you to really understand the mechanism of the sodium-potassium pump and the different steps. And then we'll ask you questions. Well, what happens if there's no ATP in the cell? What happens if we can't dephosphorylate? Uh, and different questions like that. So we, might, we want you to understand that mechanism.
The final mechanism that we want to go over, so let's erase this and let's talk about co-transport for a second. So now let's talk about a co-transport mechanism. So, again, we'll draw a membrane. And in a co-transporter mechanism, this is going to, the way I draw it is going to look a little bit like my pump in the previous one, just again, because I'm not a very good illustrator. So we got kind of a Pac-Man looking protein. Now it also has two binding sites like we did before and so we're going to make two solutes. We've got this purple square solute. We're going to put it at high concentration outside the cell. And then we're going to have a red circle. And we're going to put it at a high concentration inside the cell. Now, the way the co-transporter works is, again, it has two conformations. So let's draw up our second conformation over here. The principles involved are going to be similar to what we saw before. But we're going to apply them a little bit differently. So this will be confirmation one, this will be confirmation two, and let's just walk our way through this. Uh, first of all, our driver, we said earlier that the driver molecule moves down its concentration gradient. So we've got high concentration here, low concentration there. So the driver is going to be moving in that direction, and it wants to do that, right? It's moving from high to low. So this is with the gradient. Now, our passenger, remember we're doing an active transport mechanism, so co-transporters are active transporters. So that means that the passenger solute, we actually want to move up or against this concentration gradient. So the passenger is low here, high here, so we're actually going to be moving against the concentration gradient in terms of the passenger. Now, how does that work? Well, same strategy. We are going to be using the binding sites. We've got a binding site for the driver right here and a binding site for the passenger. And as you look at the way that we've drawn that, remember we introduced the terms tight and loose in our last uh, uh, demonstration with the sodium potassium pump. Same idea. In this confirmation, I have tight binding for the driver molecule. And then as you can see, I have probably looks like tight binding for the passenger molecule as well. And that's exactly the way this is going to work. We're going to have both the driver and the passenger bind on this side of the membrane at the same time. Although, realize that the driver is at a much higher concentration. So it's probably going to bind first, right? So we're going to have a driver molecule bind. That's step one. And that driver molecule, what it does is when it binds inside that pocket, uh, it actually is similar to something almost cocking. If you have one of those old revolvers and you cock that gun, it's now positioned, it's ready, it's energized, right? Now I just need a trigger, a pull on the trigger to release that energy. That trigger is going to be the binding 
of the passenger molecule. And so as soon as that passenger comes in and binds, it releases that energy. And the energy, so this is step two, the energy from this driver initially, initially binding is what drives the conformational shift. And so that would be step three. So we have the energizer being the driver, the trigger being the passenger. And I, I tell students this is sort of like, remember the passenger doesn't really want to be bound. It wants to stay out here free where there's not a lot going on. And so when the passenger comes in, this driver again has it already sort of set up and spring loaded. And so the passenger comes in and doesn't get any choice. It's just kind of exploring, hey, it looks like an open seat. There's root beer in the cup holder. But as soon as it binds, that conformation shift, uh, shift happens. It's almost, um, there used to be this practice. I don't know if this is a great example, but um, if you've ever heard of the term Shanghai before, and this comes from a practice that occurred during the colonial times, um, and, and it would happen in China. Ships from Great Britain would travel over to China. And it was such a long voyage to get over there that the sailors they brought with them, a lot of times, would stay in port, they'd run away um, because they wouldn't want to make the voyage back to England. And so what would happen is the captains would find themselves without enough sailors to make the uh, trip back. And so what they'd do is they'd go into the bars along the local bar uh, waterfronts and they would get uh, sailors, some of the sailors or anybody really, really drunk. And then uh, once they were really drunk and passed out, they would grab them and throw them on the boat and then they'd take off. And then when they were, you know, the next morning, they'd be however many miles out to sea, and the sailor would wake up, and he had been, quote, unquote, shanghai He'd been taken off, and now he, now he had to make the trip back to England. That's what's happening in this case. The passenger doesn't really want to go. They, they bring him in here. They, they uh, get him drunk on root beer. And then it flips, and the next thing they know, they're uh, on the inside of the cell. They don't really want to go inside the cell. Remember, there's a high concentration of passenger. But the active site changes. That seat that looked so comfortable before, that binding site now changes. And the passenger is kind of forced out against its will into the crowded uh, intracellular conditions. The driver is more than happy to leave. Right, because it's at low concentration anyway, so the driver's happy. It was going down its concentration gradient. But the passenger isn't very happy, but it has to move anyway. And so that's how a co-transporter works. The driver moving down its concentration gradient is powering the conformational shift. The passenger isn't the power, it's the trigger. We've got to wait for that passenger to get there before we, so in the mech, before it flips into the new conformation. Uh, and so that's how a co-transporter works. As soon as the driver and passenger both leave and it's empty, then the programming for this sends it, I guess this would be five, uh, four, this would be step five. Step six is it would come back to this conformation, it's empty, and then we repeat the cycle. What we've drawn up here, let's see if we can apply another term that we learned back on our concept map. This is a co-transporter. Remember, co-transporters can come in two different flavors. They can be symporters or they can be antiporters. Which flavor, which process do you think this is? Symport or antiport? And apply the definitions. Now, in this case, we have our driver moving inside the cell. Our passenger is also moving inside the cell. So this would be a symport mechanism that we've illustrated. You could draw, the rules are very similar, and we'll leave this for you as a homework assignment to go through. And what would it look like if you were to draw an anti-porter mechanism? Now, to start out with the antiporter, you'd have to figure out where the high and low concentrations of driver and solute were. That would be the first part of your mechanism. And you have to figure out, and, and you can reason your way through this, where is the tight binding going to be, where the loose. 
Anti-porters still have both of them, but I suggest which side is tight binding and which side is loose binding changes in an anti-porter mechanism. But we'll let you guys figure that out. So to review, we've learned about the terms of protein-mediated transport. We've learned about active transporters and passive transporters and mapped out all of these terms and their relationship to each other. Then we went over several mechanisms. We went over a mechanism of how a channel with gating works. We went a ligand gating uh, channel mechanism. We went over a pump mechanism, which used ATP to drive the conformational shift. And then we looked at a co-transport mechanism, which is going to use a uh, solute moving down its concentration gradient, the driver moving down its concentration gradient uh, in order to drive the conformational shift. And so that's it for today. We'll come back next time and talk about vesicle-mediated transport.